Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Richard Resnick. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at Queen's, and uh, it's my, uh, my pleasure to, um, to start this, uh, this afternoon's uh, lectureship. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, uh, Duncan G. Sinclair Lecture in Health Services Policy and Research. Uh, this is the 16th uh, Sinclair Lecture, and I'd like to extend my uh, congratulations um, uh, and thanks uh, to uh, Jacoba Lilius from the Masters of Industrial Relations Program, uh, Chris Simpson from the Department of Medicine, Marianne McCall from the Center of Health Services and Policy uh, Research, and Chris Cornish from the School of Policy Studies, who've all worked as this terrific team uh, to make this uh, lecture possible. Uh, and thank you very much for all, all of your efforts on our behalf. Uh, as Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, I'm uh, privileged uh, to meet many remarkable people, um, and Duncan Sinclair is absolutely one of those remarkable people, uh, and one that also requires very little introduction, although it's not going to stop me uh, from uh, uh, going on and on about, uh, about Duncan and, uh, and Leona. Um, so, uh, Duncan's uh, record of service uh, to Queen's has been re quite remarkable and probably unprecedented, unprecedented and probably never to be repeated. Um, uh, Duncan uh, had two deanships in arts and science and in medicine and three vice principal postings along with an incredible record of both scholarship and teaching. Uh, it's particularly uh, exciting to be able to today, literally 20 hours after it was formally released and announced, to indicate that Duncan uh, this year in May in Winnipeg will be inducted into Canada's Medical Hall of Fame. And perhaps you could, uh, yeah. And uh, not everybody uh, knows what the Canadian Mod Medical Hall of Fame is, so uh, I'll just tell you a little bit that it's been going on for, I think, 21 or 22 years um, and was conceived uh, in London, Ontario, as a way to honor our Canadian medical heroes. And each year, six illustrious Canadians are inducted into the Hall of Fame, uh, and Duncan will join approximately 105 others Canadians who over the years have been, uh, have been so inducted. In fact, this year he'll be joining two other uh, inductees who all have honorary doctorates at Queen's, uh, Dr. Bernie Langer and Dr. Alan Bernstein, who were inducted um, as, uh, who were given honorary degrees here in 2013-2014 respectively. So we're going to have a blast in Winnipeg uh, in May, and there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of oil thighs, and there'll be a lot of uh, <laughs> there'll be a lot of tricolors um, as we celebrate uh, with Duncan and Leona um, in May. Uh, Duncan's uh, many roles and achievements in public service are summarized in your program, uh, but it was. Imp uh, important uh, uh, in his work during a secondment with the MRC, the Medical Research Council, which was the pre uh, predecessor of the CIHR, um, that led to uh, the establishment of the Duncan uh, G. Sinclair Lectureship in Health Services and Policy Research here at Queen's uh, back in 1997. And that was because at the time um, and subsequently, Duncan uh, has been a staunch advocate for the importance of health policy research in Canada. And, uh, and accordingly, Duncan and Leona made a generous gift uh, to the Capital Fund in 2001, and that has been uh, the uh, genesis of the support for this event. Uh, lectureships are important to our academic community. They uh, and allow us to bring high-profile distinguished speakers to Queen's. Uh, it adds to our classroom and student experiences and it helps direct our students in important issues like health policy um, research. Um, and it also adds to the dialogue and scholarly inquiry in this key case to a key issue uh, that we'll talk about tonight around health policy. So um, thank you, Duncan, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Samir Sinha. 
uh, who's the director of uh, geriatrics at uh, both Mount Sinai Hospital and University Health Network Hospital, um, uh, and has quickly become one of Canada's most respected advocates uh, for the needs of the elderly. Uh, I know this because um, we've received, as deans across Ontario, constant petitions from, uh, from uh, Dr. Sinha about the need to augment uh, our educational efforts um, in um, uh, issues of uh, elder care. Uh, and he is, in very short order, influencing both our undergraduate and postgraduate curricula uh, across Canada. Uh, Samir's CV is very impressive, uh, a Rhodes Scholar. He has studied at the uh, former University of Western Ontario, now Western, um, the University of Oxford, and the University of Toronto. Uh, he served as the inaugural Erickson Reynolds Fellow in Clinical Geriatrics, Education and Leadership at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And he served as a member, uh, chair, and advisor on many uh, provincial and national committees. What's most impressive about Samir's work in geriatric is his work in geriatric medicine. Uh, really, in just uh, two years at Mount Sinai and uh, at the ripe age, if I may add, uh, at age 36, um, he's already proven himself as an incredibly dedicated advocate for the elderly, using his position to transform the way healthcare is delivered uh, to uh, our um, uh, to our population of those over age 65. Uh, his overarching goal, to help senior patients to return home to independent living with the highest quality of life possible. And under his direction, our, the patient's length of stay uh, at his hospitals have significantly decreased, um, as have uh, their readmission rates. Uh, and instead of uh, promoting the transfer of patients to uh, nursing homes, a significantly increased number of patients uh, at Mount Sinai now are transferred home uh, to live uh, independently. Uh, a testament to his exceptional contributions to the lives of seniors and advocacy for their independence, Samir was recently called upon by the Ontario Health Minister to lead the province's senior care strategy, uh, again, um, an, an incredible, uh, incredibly important initiative. This work couldn't come at a better time. We, uh, as everyone knows, have an aging society. Uh, by 2015, uh, we'll have that, which is just a year away, we'll have more people over 65 than under age 15. And with the incredible uh, rising costs of seniors' care, um, it's, uh, it's really important that we all pay more attention uh, to this issue in a very systematic way. So, Samir, uh, thank you for guiding us in finding solutions to these issues, and we look forward to hearing your 2014 Duncan G. Sinclair Lecture. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Resnick, and uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, Dr. Sinclair in the audience today, too. Um, I think the most important thing, I think, on my resume, uh, being here in Grant Hall, is that I'm actually a Queen's graduate myself. I actually did my undergraduate here, um, and it's Professor Rosenberg, who will remember in my third year, I begged him to, if I could be in the geography class, the health geography class that he was teaching at the time. And it was really what I count as one of those incredible experiences being a pre-medical student that got me thinking about healthcare from a very different standpoint. Um, so I always credit Dr. Rosenberg for that and it's an honor to have him here and he can see if I actually, uh, if I did him proud over time. So it's nice to be home and, uh, and it's nice to be able to share some thoughts with you today um, around this topic of Canada's coming age and more specifically, how ready are we to meet the needs of our aging population? So in terms of understanding our context to help set the stage right now, everyone's talking about aging in Canada, so what are some of the statistics? 
Right now, we know that 14.6% of Canadians are 65 and older, yet we know that nearly half of older Canadians, they represent nearly half of our health and social care spending um, in our country. And that, that's understandable. We appreciate that as we get older, we're more likely to encounter health and social care concerns. And so that, that makes sense. But again, it's only a small proportion of the population itself that's 65 and older. Yet we know why people are getting very excited about the topic of aging in particular. It's because we know that Canada's older population that's 65 and better is going to double over the next 25 years, and the population 85 and older is going to quadruple at the same time. So of course, if you start doing the math and say, wait a minute, this is a very small proportion of the population that's already accounting for half of the money we spend on health and social care, yet this population is going to double in size, you know, is that going to add up and can we actually afford that and can our healthcare system remain sustainable? So of course, you know, depending on whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person, people often will remark, I think economists like to talk about this being the, will the elderly bankrupt Canada? You know, is this going to be an enormous challenge? Are we ready? But I'm also a, a, quite an optimistic individual and I think this is an enormous opportunity. Because as I like to say, the patients have changed and the system hasn't. And the otherwise, it's also important to recognize that aging itself is not a disease, but it's actually a triumph. So, you know, when we actually think about this statistic alone, if you were born in 1900 here in Canada, you would have expected to have a life expectancy of 51 years of age. Today, it's about 81 years of age. So when people say to me, what was the greatest accomplishment of the 20th century? Some people say, we put a person on the moon. I say, I don't think so. I think the fact that we almost doubled our life expectancy is an incredible accomplishment overall. But the question is, how do we deal with that? How do we reconcile that opportunity? So we hear the terms, the aging tsunami. We also hear, this is a triumph. Well, where, does, where do we stand? Where do we stand as a country, and how ready are we? So when we think about it, right now, some of you may have read in the Globe and Mail recently that there was this index called the Global Age Watch Index. This is run by an international charity called Help Age International. They had data on 96 countries, and they ranked those countries as, uh, in terms of the best countries to age in. Canada actually scored a rank of four. So that's pretty impressive. Out of 96 countries that, part, that, that were able to partake in, and give data in the survey, the 96th country was Afghanistan. The three countries that we were behind, everyone's always curious, were Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland. The U.S. was not too far behind at number 11. So people can rest smugly and say, well, we're the fourth best country to, to live in, so that's fantastic. When you actually read the index, though, and it was, it was rather entertaining, they said, well, first of all, they said one big challenge is we have no national policy on aging in our country. But they also said when they got to the question on health care, they actually said, well, here's some of the issues with health care in Canada. The system isn't integrated. There's not enough home and community care. Um, there's a lack of primary care. And I just read a whole laundry list of things that rather concern me, especially when we're thinking about how are we going to meet the needs of an aging population. So there's always a little bit more truth beyond, uh, beyond a nice number of four that maybe we have a number of issues that we need to work with. So when you look at the health and finances, for example, as issues in their own right, there are the primary concerns of older Canadians, and this is what the polling data has actually shown of Canadians in recent years. So while 97% of Canadians in our country receive a pension, that was something that we got very good points for uh, in, uh, in the global age uh, survey, the average CPP benefits are about $6,800 per year. Most Canadians don't actually have an alternative pension to the Canada Pension Plan, so imagine if you didn't have many savings, and this is what you could count on in an annual year. So it's great that many of us receive a pension, but the majority of Canadians are worried that they're not going to have enough money to, 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 to support them in their retirement. Here's another fact. While Canadians have one of the longest life expectancies in the world, 79% are concerned about having access to quality, acute home and long-term care services as they age. So again, we have many things to be proud of, but we have many things that we cannot let our eyes off the ball, and we have to make sure that we're focusing on this so that we can really ensure this is a triumph and perhaps not a tsunami. 
So as they always like to say, you know, this is a picture of a canary in the coal mine, if you will, and maybe this is, you know, some data that's actually showing us that while maybe our federal government would like to say we're number four, we don't have to do anything different, we're not too bad. You know, the key is there are telltale signs that our system may need ways that we can improve it so we can better meet the health and social care needs of, of Canadians as we age. So this is the data in Ontario. We have primarily an Ontario audience here today. But right now, remember that 14.6% of our population in Ontario is currently 65 and better. But you'll see here that 42% of our hospitalizations the other year in Ontario were accounted for by older adults. So 42% by that small percentage of the population. But we also know that older people tend to stay longer in hospital. This is their data. And you can see that that's why older adults, 14.6% of the population, represent 60% of our hospital bed days in Ontario. So again, we only have 1.9 million older Ontarians, but they represented 3.7 million days in hospital. So after I graduated from Queens and went on to med school and I was in the hospital every day looking at my list, 60% of those patients being older adults, you have to imagine that I started believing that maybe you have a different way of aging than I did growing up in Winnipeg and Manitoba, that probably in, in Ontario, I was pretty convinced by the end of my internship that Older Ontarians, when they reach 65, they sell their house and they move into a hospital. <laughs> I mean, Mark, I have the data right, correct? <laughs> so, of course, I was pretty convinced that most older adults live in hospitals. And so I said, well, has anybody actually looked at this issue, right? And so the question was, when you actually look at aging and hospital utilization in, the, in those who are 70 and older, there was a researcher by the name of Olinsky who looked at the data in the American Longitudinal Study on Aging. And he simply followed a cohort of 7,500 older adults over a seven-year period. And he wanted to see how often do they hang out at the hospital. He was asking the same question that I was wondering about. And what he actually found was that close to half of them went nowhere close to a hospital over that time period. So 42.6%, nowhere close to a hospital. That doesn't mean that an older adult will never go to hospital. It just rem reminds us that if we're lucky enough, and most of us will, to make it to 65, we have about 20 years of life expectancy ahead of us, and 17 of those years are going to be in relatively good health. So we have a number of older people who may still be in the workforce. They may be playing with the grandkids. They may be off traveling the world, and they're not spending any time close to the hospital. But as people, as a person who works primarily in a hospital, I don't tend to see those individuals. And so even my conception of, or my ideas of what the older population look like tend to get skewed. Another quarter of the overall cohort were people who used the hospital once over the seven-year period. And that might have been to get that elective knee replacement so they could continue staying healthy and active. The rest of the pie that would add up to 100%, so about another 30%, were those individuals who used the hospital two or more times in particular. And Walensky focused on two populations. One he called the inconsistently high users, another he called the consistently high users. Now, the consistently high users, he said, would be individuals who may have chronic illnesses like congestive heart failure or chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. These are diseases that tend to flare up on a regular basis, and unless you have very good primary and community care, they can land you into a hospital if you don't have good proactive management in particular. The inconsistently high users may have those same diagnoses as well, but they may have a complicating factor. They may have something like dementia, or they may have a mental health diagnosis, because we know just having dementia alone increases your risk of hospitalization by two to three times. So Walensky focused on this small percentage of the population because what he was able to determine for us was that actually only a small proportion of our older adults are consistently extensive users of our hospital services in particular. So understanding that, then, this is what really transformed my thinking. He said, well, what defines that 10%? That 10% of the population that are quite frail and they, these seem to be very high users, is there anything that we can understand from them that can help us do better policy and planning work in particular? And so he asked this question and he found that he had three answers in particular. The things that defined the highest users were, number one, polymorbidity. So that's a nice fancy word, meaning multiple chronic health issues. So that person I was saying who might have congestive heart failure, well, they probably have underlying heart disease. 
They may have had a heart attack at some point. They probably have uh, high blood pressure. They probably have high cholesterol. They may have diabetes. Now, I've named you five issues here. You just need four to be in this club. But many of these individuals have many of these conditions. The next aspect is something we define as functional impairments. So what do I mean by that? Well, as a geriatrician and healthcare professionals, we tend to measure someone's function uh, based on their, what we call their basic activities of daily living or their activities of daily living. And your basic activity daily, uh, ba your basic daily activities of daily living, sorry, these are things that you basically need to do to be able to function, to get around, and to, and to remain independent at home. So it's these six things in this order that we probably all did this morning. You transferred from a lying to a standing position. You walked over to the bathroom. You then toileted yourself. You bathed yourself. You dressed yourself. And then you ate something. And these individuals struggle with one or more of those activities on a daily basis. They may need help to get a bath. They may need help to get out of bed or to get dressed in the morning in particular. The third factor was what he pointed out was something called social frailty. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you think about today versus 50 years ago, we're less likely to be living in intergenerational households today. We're less likely to be living in intergenerational communities. I take the example of my family. My parents are aging in place in Winnipeg. They had two sons. That was their first mistake. Uh, and then, you know, well, they had a geriatrician, so they think they made up for that loss. But the key was, you know, they have two sons. One's living in Toronto. The other's in Baltimore. And, of course, I get worried every winter, you know, Winnipeg having a lot of snow, Kingston not the exemption as well, because at least, you know, if mom or dad will need help in future getting their groceries, there's an app for that, right? But if mom or dad need help with snow shoveling, there is no app for that, right? What really is helpful is when you have a friend or a family member, you know, close at hand who can help you with a basic task. And when we surveyed Ontarians, 23% of older Ontarians tell us that they do not have a family member or a friend close at hand who could help them with a basic task like getting a prescription. So we are leading more socially isolated lives, and these are the individuals that we see are the most extensive users of our hospital services. So that's why every time I develop a new model or work with a group, I make sure that we're addressing these three issues, because if you only address one or two, that's a reason why they get readmitted to your hospital, or that's a reason why they can no longer remain in the community, because each of these factors is equally important in particular. So if you think about that individual struggling with those three issues, you probably have a family member, you may have a friend who may be experiencing that situation, and then imagine how hard it is for them to navigate the system and stay healthy and independent in their own homes. And so as I traveled around Ontario talking to, to Ontarians, and I spelt Canadians wrong there too, apologies Dr. King, as my English professor, uh, the, uh, the, uh, these are some of the things that we've noticed in particular. Number one, we do very little to empower older adults and caregivers with the information they need to navigate the system, right? We have people all the time, you know, well-educated individuals and who are not healthcare professionals who say simply just tell me where to go and I'll read about it and then I'll figure that out. But so many people are caregiving in the dark. So many people don't know where to start in particular. And it's terrible where in my clinic I always have. It's not a usual clinic unless I have someone break down and cry as a caregiver and say I'm just so overwhelmed I don't even know where to go. And when we surveyed a thousand caregivers as part of our work with the senior strategy, 50% said they didn't know what CCACs were, those are our community care access centers, and they didn't know what services they provide. At the same time, I got dozens of letters from people saying, Dr. Sinna, as a caregiver, you have to understand that it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job. We're not doing enough to support people to get the information they need to navigate the system. Dr. Resnick talked about the letters that he receives from myself and my colleagues and the minister in terms of reminding ourselves that you know, we have a wonderfully publicly funded education system, yet we don't actually require any of our current or future health or social care professionals to learn about the care of the elderly. So when I went through medical school at the time, and it's, unfortunately it's still the case, there's no medical school in Ontario that requires mandatory training in geriatrics. Okay? Everyone has mandatory content and, and mandatory rotations in pediatric medicine, which is great, but everyone, if we play our cards right, is going to age, and everyone wants to make sure that their healthcare professionals know 
how to take care of them. But it's not just the, the, the medical graduates of our province. It's also our nurses, our social workers, our therapists, even personal support workers who provide the majority of the home care in this province. I remember meeting with a number of them, and they said, we often take care of people who have dementia, but we're told how to bathe someone. We're never told how to bathe someone who may not be able to recognize me or may have responsive behaviors. We need to do better for all of our professionals. We also tend to, as everyone sees their healthcare professionals typing on computers, everyone has this wonderful thought that we're probably all communicating with each other then, that all of our records are interchangeable, that we're all communicating, but we tend not to talk to each other well within and between our sectors and our professions. You know, many physicians in our province, say family physicians, don't get discharge summaries in a timely manner after someone's discharged from the hospital. So how are they supposed to know how to redirect or further the care of their patients when they're not getting that information in a timely way? And so with those examples where primary care is not really well connected to community care, that whole sector is not even connected to the hospitals well, we tend to work in silos and not as a system. And it again does a further disservice to our patients. And finally, when we look at healthcare planning and policy, a lot of it's done on a four-year electoral cycle. And often we're planning for today, saying, what do people need today? What is the Toronto Star or the Globe and Mail or the Whig Standard? What do they say that we need today? And we'll react and provide that. As opposed to saying, wait a minute, we know that our older population is going to double over the next 20 years. Do we have the right mix of home and community care? Do we have the right mix of, of long-term care? What do we need to make sure that we can meet those needs as we age? So the reason why this matters is it should matter to all of us because we all pay for our health care. We all contribute, and it's our money that we trust other people to help redistribute and pay for. So ISIS is a group in Ontario that actually takes all our health data and can do wonderful analyses. So I asked them to recreate the Walensky paper for Ontario. And what they did was they took a look at all the health care spending for those who are 65 and better in our province. Remember that older adults almost account for half of our health and social care spending. So many people don't even know how much money we spend on health care in Ontario. Well, the number is $50 billion. That's of public funds alone. So imagine then, let's say $24 billion is accounted for by older adults in Ontario. Well, the most complex 10% of older adults account for 60% of that $24 billion. So if you think about it, 190,000 Ontarians may be accounting for about $13, $14 billion a year. So when I showed this data to the minister, she said, well, you know what, maybe... That's what it costs. Maybe it costs $13 billion to care for 190,000 people. Or maybe this is actually the byproduct of we're not integrating care well for people. Because maybe if we did a better job, it shouldn't be that costly. And maybe that's where the savings can be achieved. Because at the same time, when you look at the healthiest 50% of our older population, they account for only 6% of our spending. So again, her other job for me was, you know, can you make that number grow bigger? You know, how do we actually help older Ontarians to stay healthy and independent so that they don't need to be significant users of our healthcare system? So you see, we have two issues here at play. And this is our dilemma. It's not just the way our healthcare system, but the way our cities, our communities, and our healthcare system are currently designed, resor resourced, and organized, and delivered often disadvantages older adults with chronic health issues. Because people also forget the statistic. When we created Medicare just over 50 years ago, the average age of a Canadian was 27 years of age. So you imagine, if we're in the room today and say, what health care do we need? We would not create the system that we had 50 years ago because we're now 20 years older on average as Canadians. And chronic illnesses and diseases, those are the hallmarks of what we spend our health care dollars around, not issues that are more prevalent for younger people. And at the same time as Canadians today, our care needs, our preferences and values are evolving as a society with increasing numbers of us wanting to age in place. So how do you reconcile those two differences between, especially in a situation when I said the patients have changed and the system hasn't, maybe it's time for the system to catch up with the population it is meant to serve today. So you'll see a number of black and white photos, the one at the beginning and, and, and the ones that continue. These are photos of patients that I take care of that I also take care of with my colleague, Dr. Mark Nowachinsky. He's also another Queen's graduate. You're seeing a theme here. We don't only take care of Queen's graduates, by the way. Um, but Dr. Mark, actually, he's the lead of the program called House Calls that provides home-based primary care to frail older adults. 
But Dr. Mark, like myself, is an advocate. I like to talk a lot and write a lot. He likes to photograph. And by photographing his older patients, he's been able to give a window in on the lives of these individuals who are sometimes forgotten in the big health care debates. And this is one of our patients. This is Mr. W. I'm sure you're trying to think, I wonder how old he is. I don't think any of you will get the right number. He's now 104 and a half still living independently in his own home. He has a fascinating story behind him. He has a very subversive sense of humor. Um, he actually got to meet Jeffrey Simpson, I think, just two years ago. Jeffrey was, it was in, in Toronto. He said, Samir, I'd like to hang out and talk health policy with you. I said, I'm actually doing home visits with Dr. Mark. And he's like, can I come on a home visit? We took him to see Mr. W. That was a rather entertaining experience for us all, right? Mr. W, you can tell, is very smart. Uh, if you look at the windowsill, you can see the two Rubik's Cubes. Uh, he's very sharp individual, but he's fiercely independent, and he wants to age in place. He wants to remain at home. And I think for Mr. W, when you meet him, you realize, I aspire to be like Mr. W, and so he agreed to be the poster elder for our senior strategy. So why develop a provincial strategy? Well, in 2011, the province announced its new vision to make Ontario the best place to grow up and grow old in North America. So to be number one, if you will. So given our current and future challenges, though, the development of a senior strategy was started in 2012 to help establish some sustainable best practices and policies at a provincial level. Because again, this is not just a Toronto issue, it's not just a Kingston issue, it's an issue that unites us all in Ontario, but also across the entire country. And so as I started the work, you know, and started asking Ontarians what was important to them, People were very quick to say, we want some ground rules here, because if you're going to make recommendations to actually help influence the way we transform our healthcare system and the way, you know, our province works, we want to make sure that all your recommendations adhere to five core principles, and those were of equity, quality, access, value, and choice. I hope that's not me. Um, so with that, the, uh, the goal of these recommendations was really to support older Ontarians to stay healthy and independent for as long as possible. So I had a very busy summer in 2012. My uh, predecessor that I got to, to work with and who mentored me, Dr. David Walker, who many of you will know, um, I had, had the privilege of working with, with David as he was leading a big uh, piece of work around the ALC strategy. And David had done a lot of work recognizing that um, we really need to get our heads around caring for an aging population. That was the title of his report. So the one thing that I was told was David only visited seven of the 14 health regions regions. And you know, there was criticism for that. So you have to visit all 14, which was a privilege. But it meant that I ended up getting to interact with thousands of older Ontarians, hundreds of stakeholder groups, and that culminated in a report that was 234 pages in length called Living Longer, Living Well. It essentially created a blueprint for how we can plan to age well, to live longer and live well in Ontario. And I was just told by the ministry the other day that that report has been now downloaded now 50,000 times in countries as far away as Bhutan. So these were, for those of you who don't have the time, for the pol health policy graduates who say, Dr. Rosenberg, we do not want to read this full report. We want to go to the, the quiet pub or, uh, or to uh, Clark Hall to go drinking tonight. I'll give you the quick Coles Notes summary here. So these are the strategic themes and areas of focus, also conveniently the chapter titles. And again, this really focused on what Ontarians said were important. People want to make sure that it's not just about our healthcare system, but we have to make sure that our communities are age-friendly, that our communities can be prepared to help meet the needs of us as we age. And this talk encompasses issues from housing and transportation to making sure that older Ontarians are not, and older Canadians, are not going to be aging in poverty. People also wanted to know, what can I do as a citizen to stay healthy and well into my older age? Are there things that I can do so that I don't end up with illness um, and that I can stay independent? And then what are the things we need to do? How do we have to do, make changes to our primary care, our home and community care, all the different aspects of our healthcare system in order to make sure that it can meet the needs of an aging society? And not forgetting specific groups like our caregivers, because we have millions of unpaid caregivers in Ontario, and we often you know, take for granted the enormous contributions they make to meeting the needs. How do we actually address issues that are still prevalent, like ageism and elder abuse? And how do we make sure that we're addressing the unique needs of populations like our older Aboriginal peoples or our LGBTQ elders as well? And then what are the enablers? What do we need to enable a senior strategy? 
you know, research and investments, making sure that we have an educated workforce that can meet the needs of an aging population. These are the things we want to talk about. So in total, there were 166 recommendations. There were 33 broader recommendations that touched seven ministries that really focused on those broader issues, if you will, around aging in Ontario. And then there were 133 recommendations specifically directed to the Minister of Health to really think about how we could improve care along the continuum itself. So the province in early 2013, I handed the report in December uh, of 2012, and then in early 2013 in January, the government responded with its action plan for seniors. And it said that we're going to focus on three core themes for our action plan. Those of elder-friendly communities, those of how do we make sure that Ontarians or remain older Ontarians can stay healthy, and how do we promote the safety and security of older Ontarians. And to enable this, it was actually the first time that our government finally appointed its standalone minister for seniors. Before that, I remember working with a wonderful minister for seniors who's also the minister for labor, right? And she often complained. She said, this is always kind of short shrift when we're actually saying this is a tag-along ministry as opposed to its own ministry. So the government appointed its first standalone minister responsible for senior affairs to help with the implementation of these recommendations and the report. So how are we li enabling living longer and living well in Ontario? Well, around establishing elder-friendly communities, there's a lot of work that's been happening where we have a number of Ontario municipalities who are working to establish themselves as World Health Organization-designated age-friendly cities. And this means that you have to make a significant commitment. So I helped write the Toronto, City of Toronto Senior Strategy, working with the City of Ottawa. Peel Region has released the new Senior Strategy. Many communities are now working towards this as well. Many municipalities are investing more in support of housing services. There's a new Healthy Homes Renovation Tax Credit. The Ministry of Transportation is looking at how do we support creating more uh, transportation services to help people navigate around their community. You've heard about the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, which will ensure that no older Ontarian in future will age in poverty. And then there's new legislation and measures that have been pursued to support caregivers. So what defines an age-friendly community or an elder-friendly community? Well, this is how the World Health Organization defines it. It's a community that responds and res recognizes the great diversity amongst older persons. It promotes their inclusion and contributions in all areas of community life. It respects their decisions and their lifestyle choices, and it anticipates and responds flexibly to aging-related needs and preferences. I love reading this every time I see it because it reminds us of what we should be aspiring to because I think all of us would aspire to live in a community like this. And these are the different aspects of that age-friendly community. And you'll see it's not just about community support and health services. It's thinking about transportation, housing, social participation, civic engagement. And again, you remember that aspect about communication, information, making sure people can be informed. And even thinking about how do we design our public spaces so people can easily navigate around them um, with those principles of universal design. When we think about what we've been moving forward on in terms of ensuring the health of older Ontarians, there's been investments in health promotion and prevention activities for older Ontarians. There's now 2,000 free exercise and falls prevention classes around uh, to, that have served 106,000 older Ontarians last year. There's a real push to make sure that more older Ontarians are getting the primary care they need um, and getting a primary care provider. Um, and this has been a real big priority in particular. Uh, and more Ontarians are now getting house calls as well. There have been more investments in home and community care. The traditional scopes of practice are being expanded to improve more caring options closer to home. So you may soon be hearing more about something called community paramedicine. Um, and many of you know that pharmacists, your local pharmacists, can give you a flu shot today as well. And as Dr. Resnick mentioned, we're doing a lot of work right now to make sure that our health and social care workforce, both our current and future workforce, has the knowledge and skills they need to care for an aging population. So, as well from thinking about safety and security, there's been a number of work. The Ontario Poli Provincial Police have actually embraced the strategy and have actually been working on modules to make sure that every police officer in Ontario understands how to work with people who may have dementia, for example, and how to actually respond more sensitively to the needs of aging uh, individuals. Uh, there's a lot of work going on around elder abuse as well, um, and we recently launched the first national guidelines to address and prevent elder abuse and neglect. 
neglect. Uh, and then there's a lot of work going on to combat social frailty. So I'm hoping that there will soon be some more investments to expand the number of two, the 277 older adult centers we have in our province that served 250,000 older Ontarians last year. And there are the senior community grants initiatives that are available to actually help older adults who want to do social activities and network with each other. There are these ways, again, subtle ways, but important ways of combating social frailty. And so this is, in a sense, the concept of what excellent care for older Ontarians is starting to look like, if you will, in one slide. It's about promoting wellness across elder-friendly communities. It's about helping people to age in place. It's about making sure that we have elder-friendly hospital care and effective transitions, and making sure that for those people who need long-term care, that we have good quality long-term care available. So this is kind of the overall strategy at a glance. This is one of our patients um, who passed away last year, but she got her wish and she was able to die at home. This is Nina. And of course, you'll see this picture and thought, oh, Mark was just thinking, let's just take a picture of a, of a, a lovely, nice lady who's just saying, oh, aren't you a nice doctor? Well, again, a picture tells a thousand words, right? Nina, as I learned when she died, was actually a fierce you know, community organizer. She had come from the Ukraine, and she actually helped found the first nursing home, Ukrainian-focused nursing home in Ontario. Um, she also taught a lot of people how to speak Ukrainian. She was a fierce advocate for women's rights. And when I met Nina, she was 97 at the time, and she had just come out of hospital, a horrific hospitalization, and she was, her, her caregiver, her personal support worker, brought her to Dr. Mark's attention. Um, and she was very clear, saying, I'm never going to go back to hospital. And she said, oh, and you're the provincial lead? I have a lot to tell you right? So again, a picture tells a thousand words, if you will. So in terms of understanding our choices, again, these are just some of the slides that I think has been very helpful to kind of hit home some of the reasons why we need to be thinking differently. We have no choice but to think differently. This is actually how we spend our health care dollars by age. And what you can see is this is the funding in 2010. And you'll see here that obviously the bulk of the funding is spent, you know, towards the later years of life. That's just the reality of how it is. But this is what the bulge and this is what it looks like in 2030. If we do nothing differently, if we keep doing the wrong care, you know, to the wrong people in the wrong place, the wrong providers, this is exactly what we're going to pay for as Canadians. Again, you know, the idea of the price for not making sure that we have good, integrated, uh, holistic care available. So the, there's a huge opportunity here to keep our health care system sustainable by actually changing what we do. But of course, this will require choices. This is actually how we spent that $50 billion piece of, uh, of the pie. And you can see that a lot of our big ticket items are around where our original health care priorities were, around hospitals, around physician services, around nursing services in particular. And you'll see that the sliver for home and community care is a very small sliver. In fact, that for every $4 we spend on long-term care in Ontario, that's nursing home care, that supported just over 100,000 people last year, we spent $3 uh, for our home and community care services that supported close to a million older Ontarians last year. So we get a lot of bang for our buck on those minimal home and community care dollars. But again, when our pie is not continually increasing, you've heard about the health care transfers being cut, for example. You hear about this massive deficit that the government's wrestling with and a commitment to only allow our health care budget to increase by 2%. The question is, what do you grow? What do you not grow? What do you shrink? These are the choices we now have to make. And this is actually how we look at spending, where Canada ranks against the other nations. Again, while we can say we're number four, if you will, when you start looking at the broader data, I might have done the data a little bit differently. So you can see we're proudly represented by the maple leaf. The yellow bars in this chart represent uh, spending on long-term care. The blue bars represent spending on home and community care. And you can actually see that across Canada, it's almost for every $5 we spend on, uh, on long-term care, we spend a dollar on home and community care. So we're a little bit ahead of the game in Ontario. But you'll see that there are three countries in this whole, um, in, in this chart, that actually spend more money on home and community care than they do in long-term care. That's Denmark, the farthest to the left. That's Poland and Austria. So what do they know that we're only starting to figure out in particular? Well, we have choices and options. And right now, again, we fund our health care, and this is how you're spending your money. A day in hospital, I can tell you a day at Mount Sinai Hospital today is $951 every day. 
A day in long-term care or nursing home care is about $130 a day. But a day of supportive housing services or a day of home and community care only costs about $55 a day. So, of course, I know that we underfund the workers who are in our home and community care system, but any way you do the math, it's a lot cheaper than spending a day in hospital in particular. And so the key is this is what Denmark learned, because Denmark actually avoided building any new long-term care beds over two decades and actually saw the closure of thousands of hospital beds by actually strategically investing more in their home and community care services. And by doing that over the last number of years, you'll probably hear that the biggest budget increase in health care now has actually been in our home and community care budget. But so last year, for example, the home and community care budget in Ontario increased by 6.2%. That meant that hospitals last year had to get a 0% increase, second time in a row, and our doctors accepted a 0.5% pay cut. Again, it's about more or less, if you will. But that meant $260 million more, a quarter billion more into our home and community care system. Is it enough? No. Do we need to invest more? Absolutely. But we're starting to head in the right direction. So when we think about how this translates up to a Canadian level, you know, do we need to start thinking about a national senior strategy? Everyone keeps saying that, well, you know, you know, especially with our current federal government, they say, well, health care really is a provincial and territorial responsibility. We want to do the right thing, and that's just not interfere. We don't want to interfere with the autonomy of the provinces. But currently, a quarter of our health care dollars actually come from our federal taxes. So the actual federal government has a huge opportunity to help us engage together and to unify us together on issues of national importance. <coughs> So in the last health care accords, for example, the money was to focus on a common issue of importance, and that was of wait times. But now I think the number one issue facing our health care system, you'll hear Chris Simpson, the president of the Canadian Medical Association, and the... Um, and one of our medical leads here at Queen's, you know, will talk about his mandate now as the president of the Canadian Medical Association is to promote the idea of a national senior strategy. Because recent Canadian Medical Association surveys have determined a number of important things. Well, first of all, 93% of the Canadians they surveyed believe that we need a pan-Canadian senior strategy. So I'm glad it's not just me, but that 93% of Canadians think it's a good idea. 89% believe that this is going to require the cooperation at all levels of government. So not just the provincial governments, not just the municipal governments, but also our federal government as well. And 78%, as I just said, believe the federal government has an important role to play because there are things that the federal government can influence at a national level. 63% also believe that the most important focus needs to be on strengthening home and community care. Again, where our focus is now led to in Ontario. And I like this, and if any politicians are watching, and I'm sure if you are, 60% of the respondents indicated they would switch parties if their current political party failed to make older Canadians a priority in the next federal election. So frankly, you know, I have the answer for you right now. It's just a matter of who wants to make their senior strategy better. So I'll give you some suggestions here for the politicians who may be watching. And Chris and I are advocating quite strongly around these individuals as well. So right now in March 2013, so shortly after, the, uh, after we launched the senior strategy or released the senior strategy on terror, I was very privileged that Minister Matthews, our former health minister, actually had me come and deliver her speech. She gave me her speaking time in front of all of her provincial and territorial minister colleagues um, to really talk about what we had done in Ontario. And I was happy that by the end of the meeting, they actually agreed to make caring for seniors one of the three core areas for focus for interprovincial cooperation. I don't think they've moved quickly enough. You know, they haven't really fully defined that, but I'm glad at least that there is some agreement that this is an issue that, that uh, unites many groups. In March 2014, Ontario PI in Manitoba announced that their interest in establishing supplemental pension plans to stave off a retirement income crisis, and Ontario has now moved ahead, and it will be implementing that within 2017. And we know that more municipalities, not only in Ontario but across the country, are actually seeking to be age-friendly cities and get that designation from the World Health Organization because it makes our communities more attractive for people to move towards, but it also makes sure that people can continue to age in place and be productive members of their communities. And now we're starting to see more increasing attention being paid to the needs of caregivers as well. 
So I say that it's actually time for a national senior strategy, and I think that these are the six things that could actually be part of the things that we should focus on, and Chris announced this as an inaugural speech a few months ago. Addressing the social determinants of health, including poverty reduction, and creating more affordable housing and transportation services with the appropriate uh, cooperation of all levels of government support. We need a national strategy that promotes greater investments in health promotion and prevention for older Canadians. We need a strategy that encourages all provinces to support the greater provision of access to a primary care provider and the primary care that includes house calls. We need to make sure that those future investments in health care are really prioritized around home and community care, making sure that we strengthen our long-term care system, and making sure that we start making sure, uh, investments to support our unpaid caregivers as well. And we also want to ensure that our current and future health and social care workforce has the knowledge and skills they need to care for an aging population. And finally, we need to make sure that we have a system that improves the delivery of culturally safe and competent care that addresses the ethnocultural needs of our diverse aging population. So these are six ideas, six ideas that we're kicking around as groups as the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Nursing Association, and many other groups that are coming together because we're now calling on the federal government and all three federal parties, as well as our provincial governments, to say, I think these are priorities that every government should be prioritizing moving forward. So as I said, we're entering a federal election year in 2015. And of course, there are parties that want to get reelected. There are parties that want to form government. And so there's an opportunity. And we know that right now that older Canadians are increasingly becoming concerned about how they're going to manage their health, their finances, transportation, and housing needs to support aging in the place of their choice. One thing I remember, I, had, uh, I, I met with the mayor of a large Ontario city recently, and I said, why are you so keen around, you know, around you know, age-friendly cities and these things all of a sudden? And he simply looked me straight in the eye and he said, come on, Samir, seniors vote. In fact, older Canadians have the highest voter participation rates in particular, 80%, right? It's almost double what younger Canadians have. So this is a great demographic to target. And again, I'm giving you a nice platform plank right here, everyone, right? And implementing a national senior strategy can provide us exactly the focus and the commitment we need to ensure that we can become the best country in which to grow up and grow old. So I end by saying... Is Canada ready to meet the needs of its aging population? Well, I think time will tell, but I think we are ready, because I think as Canadians we are interested, we know what the challenge lies ahead, and I think we have it in us to go from number four to number one and be truly you know, acknowledging that, yeah, we really are number one in future. So I think we can get there, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Samir. Thank you. My name is Kim Nossel. I'm the uh, director of the School of Policy Studies, uh, the uh, other co-sponsor of uh, the, uh, the lecture series. Um, uh, Dr. Sin has very kindly agreed to uh, um, answer some questions. Um, and uh, as you, some of you know, uh, this is being podcast live. Uh, and so uh, there are questions that may come uh, through via uh, email, um, uh, but we'll begin with, uh, with, the, uh, with the audience here, um, and if there are any people who are watching on podcast and you have a question uh, for Samir, uh, you, uh, you know how to get uh, your question posed here. Um, could I ask, please, uh, if you've got a question, uh, um, to, uh, to identify yourself, um, and uh, let's, let's start the questioning. And we have, we have a mic there, if, uh, if you would please speak to the mic. My name's Alicia Gordon. I'll get back from the mic a little. Um, what province has the most number of uh, seniors in Canada? So the province that has the most number, just by sheer numbers, is Ontario, with 1.9 million older Ontarians, at about 5 million older Canadians. Okay, I want to tell you about a program that I sit on the board with, if I can, mm -hmm. and ask you what you think about this program. It's called OASIS. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if you've heard of it. I know it well. Okay, so I, and what do you think of that program? I think it's a great program, again. And do you think we could take it across Canada? So do you want to just say a few words about Oasis is? Just sure. for those who don't know. <laughs> and actually, I'll tell you, the previous Minister of Health asked me, do you know about Oasis in Kingston? Okay, so you're great. That's great that you're familiar with it because I think it's a really good innovative healthcare program that can t be taken across the province as well as across the country. And what it is, it's a group of seniors that live together. They get to vote on what they eat. They become a community. They have three meals a day in the basement of a, a building that is actually uh, owned by uh, Homestead. And Homestead gives the bottom of the building so they can have fitness classes there, play bridge, play cards, have three meals uh, that are uh, reasonably priced. And it's for those seniors who can't afford the three to four thousand dollars a month to go into a retirement um, care facility. So this is a way to help those seniors who, who can't afford that. So what they do is they pay rent. There's a PSW on staff. So, and, and, and seniors do not become isolated. That's an important part in their mental health is that they're together as one community in this building and they each help each other. So there could be several buildings that would be set up with this sort of a program. And I think, again, this is that classic example of supportive housing services, right? Remembering that everybody wants to age in different ways, and we need to enable that. And especially, because not everyone can afford a retirement home, for example. And not everyone wants to go to a retirement home. But if people want to live together with others so they can stay independent in their communities, these are just some of the examples that we need to do more support of and figure out what is the right mix of services like these um, in our communities. Thank you. Dave. Samir, David Walker, um, thank you for this. It's, uh, it's been very enlightening. Um, I'd like to ask you a difficult question. Um, my hospital, KGH, uh, tertiary care hospital for the region, has been in an almost steady state of code gridlock the last few weeks, meaning that people who need tertiary services in southeast Ontario really cannot access them because the emergency department is filled with uh, patients who are waiting admission upstairs and there are no beds upstairs because there's about a 20% ALC rate. Um, if that is the status today, how will that look 10 years from now? And are we really ready? Thank you, David. So, I mean, this is the challenge that we have across hospitals in Ontario. Again, you saw the numbers that many of those patients who, you know, are in our hospital beds at KGH right now are older patients. Um, many of them may be in challenging situations. David was saying that 20% of them are designated ALC. That's a fancy acronym for alternate level of care, meaning they're just waiting to be able to go home with community care. They're waiting to go to a long-term care or to a rehab, uh, rehab hospital, for example. Uh, and these individuals can't move uh, to where they need to go, and therefore things block up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and sometimes we then, give, we then blame those individuals, saying, you're bed blockers. You know, if you weren't here, the system would be at better. Um, and of course, it kind of forecasts, if we don't get things right, if we don't do things differently, then, you know, what's the situation going to be 10 years from now, KGH, it's going to be a lot worse. So part of the, I think there's a huge opportunity, though, because one of the things we talked a lot about in the past was that I think we tend to manufacture some of the problems we have, that sometimes these problems could actually be avoided if we did things differently. So Mount Sinai Hospital, where I principally work and, across, and the University Health Network hospitals, but you know, we had the exact same challenges. Um, we had the exact same challenges. But what we did was we thought differently. We said, wait a minute, the Walensky paper, everyone knows about the Walensky paper, and they said, we should basically screen everyone when they come in our front door to find out if they're those high-risk older adults or whether they may be the low-risk ones. The high-risk ones, then, we stick on them like glue. We have GEM nurses, geriatric emergency management nurses in the eMERGE, who then interview them, work with them very carefully, and then we have a whole system with order sets that make sure we don't order medications that can be harmful to older people, and we make sure that we practice mobilization. We say to everybody, move it or lose it. We've got to keep people active and fit so they don't decondition and then end up needing long-term care. My favorite statistic at our hospital now is that if you came to Mount Sinai four years ago, you had a 70% chance of being able to return to your own home. Okay? Today, you have an 80% chance 
of going home, mainly because we don't need to send people to rehab or long-term care as much anymore because we're making sure they don't decondition. We're making sure we avoid what we call the hazards of hospitalization. So I'm not saying that that strategy alone will be the answer at KGH. Health systems are complex. Sometimes there's not the right mix of services. But I think this is where we have to think about what does the community have? Where do we need to make those investments at the community level? But then how do we need to re-examine our practices that may not have changed for the last 50 years because they've been tremendously successful at our organization and it's glad to see that KGH and others have been making big gains because they've actually been able to adopt some of those practices and, and create some of their own as well. Yes. Um, I hope I can be given the luxury of two questions. My name is Jennifer Hudson, and I do research in human rights and home-based health care. Um, my first question is um, urban-centric versus rural delivery of services. I'm, I'm still seeing urban-centric, and I'm questioning how much emphasis is being given to seniors who want to uh, age in place in rural communities. Okay, and what's your second question? The second question is uh, in regard to PSWs. They're unregulated, unregulated in terms of their training and in terms of their practice. And is there any movement towards putting them under the Health Professions Act? Right. So um, I'll answer the second question first, and then, and then, um, and then I'll talk about uh, uh, that. So PSWs, people are hearing that term, and just in case you're not into the healthcare lingo, um, PSW stands for personal support workers. These are the care workers that provide the bulk of the home care. They provide the personal care like bathing or helping someone get dressed or feeding somebody. Um, they basically are the unsung heroes of our system because until recently you could make more money working at Tim Hortons than you could delivering care to you know a demented elder for example in in their own home so we you know the the fact is if we're going to build a strong home and community care system we have to give a dignified wage to these individuals we also have to make sure that we make sure that this workforce which is largely as you said unregulated becomes more regulated so there's been moves towards regulation such as creating what we call the PSW registry these are early steps to make sure that we know who actually is doing this work and then we also make sure that their curriculum actually has certain defined common standards. So we're moving towards that. That's not fully there, but there is a whole process going on at the provincial level to do that. So that's where, we're, we're, that's where steps are being made in that area. And I think it's important because I think it gives more focus and status to this profession, but it also makes sure that we ensure that they have the right skills and knowledge they need. In terms of the question, is, is our healthcare system more urban-centric or rural-centric? It's absolutely more urban-centric, right? Where's Queen's Park? Queen's Park is located right in downtown Toronto. Where does Queen's Park easily go to get their information? You know, we're all a bit lazy. We're just going to walk a few feet. No Dr. Sinna happens to be conveniently a few, uh, a few uh, steps down, right? So the, 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 the key is that, you know, we have a system often that people think about most of the people who make the decisions are people who live in cities but you know there's been a lot of work and I really did focus on the issues of northern and rural communities um, in particular and I've actually been quite a strong advocate of those northern and rural issues and how do we make sure that we don't forget uh, those issues in particular and I'll give you one small example that ties in PSWs when I actually went, the elders, of the, the elders of the James Bay Coastal Communities, which actually Queen's University has a connection with Moose Factory and the, the Fort Albany and that whole group of First Nations there, well, their elders said, well, if Dr. Sin is traveling around the province, I hope he doesn't forget us. Mm -hmm. So their chief sent me an invite and said, will you come up and dialogue with us? And I said, absolutely. So I went up with a team of delegates of, of folks from across uh, the Northeast Lynn. And we went to every community. We met with all the elders in the community, including the oldest respondent in the senior strategy, Granny Wabanow, who's 109 years old, living in a supportive housing environment uh, uh, in, in Moose Factory. And, uh, and what they told us was we don't actually have any personal support workers here. We don't have a CCAC here because there's nobody to employ. So we don't even get personal care at home. So if we can't get home care and we have bigger needs, we get shipped out of the community to a long-term care nursing home hundreds of miles away. It's devastating. It's horrific. And this is a, these are communities that had some of the worst residential schools 
in the country. So you can imagine how complex that is. So I actually teamed up with a group of geriatricians. We created the first uh, uh, fly-in geriatrics clinic, and we've had some enormous success. We started with Fort Albany First Nation. But I also tagged the Red Cross. My friends at the Red Cross and said, could we do better? Can we actually create a grow-your-own PSW program? So we started a program uh, that was funded by the Northeast Lynn. We've actually trained 40 PSWs in those communities, local women, local men, who now have jobs that pay well, and they actually are providing care that's needed by the elders in the community. And when they had the graduation a few weeks ago at Fort Albany, the entire community came out to the arena. It was the biggest day, you know, because they were so proud because it was about self-care and it was about us enabling and recognizing an opportunity to do things differently, especially in small communities that we don't think about often on University Avenue. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Glenn Brown. I'm head of the Department of Family Medicine here at Queen's. And uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentation and the comments you just made about services on James Bay. It's so important. I do need to correct something you said, though, about training of health professionals in Ontario and that no one has specific objectives around treatment of the elderly. Family medicine does. <clears throat> so amongst in our accreditation requirements, certainly there are very specific requirements about uh, uh, academic requirements and clinical training requirements in care of the elderly. And certainly here at Queen's, each and every one of our 160 residents care for a group of patients in a long-term care facility as one component of their training in care of the elderly. I think that that would be true in most family medicine programs across the country because of the accreditation requirements. So speaking of the role of family medicine, I, I would also like to uh, point out a problem in Ontario in that uh, we're gaining with the primary care transformation agenda. We have gained experience in working in teams. And here at Queen's, we're a family health team. And as you know, that means that we work with a team of allied health professionals. That really allows us to work in the community much more than we could when we were solo family doctors or even family doctors working in a group. So when you speak of house calls, I would say now that in our team, more of the house calls are done by our, our nurses or by our foot care person or by our diabetic educator to go into the home and help people that have difficulty getting out of the home to access care. And through those allied health professionals, these people who have mobility problems and have difficulty getting out of the home, I think are able to access uh, the same level of care as, as other people in the community. So I'm a big advocate of family health teams. I think it extends the expertise of family medicine into the community in a very effective way. But unfortunately in Ontario we're stalled at 200 family health teams and I think that's because of the uh, perceived expense of that program. But uh, I hoping you might be able to join me in advocating for further spread of that across Ontario. Thank you. The, um, so in terms of the, the aspects of primary care, you know, what I talked about in my report specifically was that, you know, as Ontarians are growing older, you know, they often have more health and social concerns, right? And so the idea of this concept of the solo practitioner, the single doctor, the family doctor, um, who could just do everything themselves, it's too complex now to do that well. And we know time and time again, the evidence shows that people, when they're working in group practices so they can share the care, but not only amongst other doctors, but around the, the greater interprofessional team, nurse practitioners, social workers, therapists, etc., that care is essentially better. I think the challenge that we have in Ontario is we have a number of different group models. We have family health teams, we have FIGs, we have FOES, we have FINS, we have, you know, we have the alphabet soup of primary care teams and so on. And the challenge that we have as well is that, you know, not all family health teams, I think what's happened, unfortunately, is that not every group practice model has actually been meeting its collective, you know, kind of objectives, if you will. There are some family health teams like yours that prioritize care for those people in their homes that make sure that their trainees are getting trained. I think the challenge that I've seen and the challenge that many programs have admitted to is that yes, those are the competencies for her family trainees, but we don't send them on house calls. We don't send them into long-term care. Even and I said, well, your competencies say you should, so why aren't you doing things more like Queens? Why aren't you doing things like McMaster? Because I can tell you some of the schools you know, it's very variable, the training that's received, unfortunately. And especially, there are some family health teams that are doing phenomenal jobs, and there are others that could be doing better, for example. So I think the challenge that I've said to this new minister and to our 
um, you know, to, you know to, to the folks you know, who are now in charge is that I think the greatest things that we need to focus on as we think about seniors as a cross-cutting issue is its primary care reform and it's community care. And it's the idea that we have an opportunity to strengthen and finally say that it's not this, this, or this, but it's about team-based care, it's about advancing it, it's about being very clear about what the objectives are and making sure it's meeting the needs of complex older patients, but also making sure that we have to think about strengthening our home and community care system and making sure that those two are talking to each other well. Because I see very, very strong healthcare systems where you have robust primary care systems that are team-based, where you have strong home and community care systems, and systems that actually talk to each other well. So I don't think that's, you know, that's not grasping for too far a straw, but it's going to take political will so that we don't end up stalled as we currently are right now. We're going to take a, uh, a question from uh, um, one of uh, the audience uh, who's watching uh, this podcast. Uh, it's from a geriatrician. Um, Sudeep Gill, and, and Dr. Gill writes uh, this. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. I completely agree with your emphasis on promoting aging in place in cases where this is possible. However, with the rising tide of older adults with significant cognitive deficits and behavioral issues from dementia for whom aging in place might not be safe or realistic, i.e. due to inadequate informal caregiver support, what do you see as the appropriate setting of care and model of care for this group? At present, many of these individuals end up in acute care and contribute to the ALC issue that you've mentioned already. Absolutely. So thank you very much, Sudeep. I know Sudeep well. And again, he raises a very good question because often people have this notion that they say, well, I want to age in place, I want to stay at my own home. But sometimes being on your own at home can be quite isolating, especially if you outlive all your friends and families, you have nobody to talk to. And this is why some people will choose to say, I want to live in a group environment like Oasis. I might want to move to a retirement home um, and you know, this is where I want to be. For those individuals who have dementia, again, you know, most of our house calls patients who are living in their own homes, some with their own families, you know, their choice is they want to live at home, they want to be supported to age in place. Many of them also live in supportive housing environments as well. I think the key is it's about not aging at home, your original home, it's aging in the place of your choice. And sometimes that choice means, especially for individuals with complex um, issues such as dementia with behavioral <coughs> needs, sometimes home is no longer a viable option. They may not have the 24-hour support they need. They may not have, you know, they may not have the funds, the resources. And so when we start thinking about what are the ideal environments, you know, sometimes it is a long-term care home that's environment, but there can also be smaller you know, settings, for example, again, that are appropriately staffed with caregivers who actually, you know, personal support workers and others who actually have the training to work with people with behavioral issues. And they've often found that the models of care that tend to work for these individuals who can no longer age in place in the community or, or you know, in that way, but need to be in a more of a, of a facilitated setting are those who are living in small group home environments where adequately trained um, and funded caregivers. The challenge we have right now, you know, is the fact is we don't fund, we're not funding our long-term care homes appropriately in some of the cases here so that they can't fund the staff to provide this care and therefore they don't feel well equipped to be able to provide that care. We also don't make it mandatory that all those people working in long-term care have training in working with people with dementia. When people with dementia number about 70% of the residents in our long-term care homes, 30% of them having aggressive behaviors, for example. So again, we have a lot of work to do, and we have to figure out how do we fund appropriate spaces so these individuals can get the care they need if it needs to be in a long-term care home, or if appropriate, within supportive housing or their own home. But I think the key is that what we're seeing right now is a system that's not well equipped to deal with these individuals appropriately. And that's why we're having a bit of this ALC crisis where people are stuck with no place to go. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Cornelio. Uh, thanks, Samir, for, for this presentation. Uh, you mentioned an important number of areas uh, for improvement in terms of uh, the policy level, uh, considering that it is a system, as you mentioned, do you identify areas where the private sector, including community organizations or local business, for instance, uh, can be part of the solution in this system? You have a lot of experience working in, 
with all of the actors, uh, all of the players in the system? Which, which kind of elements do you identify for the private sector? Absolutely. I think, you know, people get very scared when, you, when we raise the word private because we're fierce Canadians. We love, you know, Medicare and it's all about, it has to be public. And anytime someone raises the word private, all of a sudden people say, you know, get your hands off my Medicare, if you will, in that way. I think actually, you know, the, the key thing is, I think, as, as Jeffrey Simpson would have shared with you in his book in that, there's actually a lot of care that's being provided that's not publicly funded or publicly covered, for example. You know, things like dental services, for example, are only covered for poor children, for example, in our province. Everyone else has to either pay for it out of pocket or they have to get a dental plan in that way. Same with medications, unless you're an older Ontarian, for example, or, or you're, you're living in poverty, for example, um, your, um, your drugs you have to fund yourself or through a private plan, for example, uh, in that way. When it comes to thinking about what is the role, what could the role be of the private sector, I think, you know, it, it's, it's always the big debate, right? Because people get very sensitive about this issue. You know, should we, you know, you know should the private sector come in? Should, you know, if we start talking about private roles, are we looking at U.S. healthcare in, in a sense? You know, I think, you know, the way I like to see things is I think the role of government in our society has to be, it has to be governing our healthcare system and saying, this is the quality we want to achieve. These are the outcomes we want to achieve. This is how we want to get it done, for example. I think when government loses that sight and, and, and that role, and they can say, and this is the price that we're going to pay for this service. Currently now, various episodes of care and services are being priced, you know, specifically saying, for a person, an older person who comes into a hospital with congestive heart failure, the government will pay about $7,000 for that care episode, for example. When you start thinking about things like home care, for example, actually a lot of the providers of home care in Ontario are private providers, for example, of government-funded home care are actually private providers, and they work under these contracts through the CCACs. CCACs will say, you know, who can provide this care to our population, and it could be both a not-for-profit or a private provider. Sometimes people say, well, the not-for-profit sector always provides better care. Other people will say the private sector can provide it, you know, cheaper, more efficient, whatever. My view in the end is what we need to do as a government is be very clear on what the price is. We need to be very clear on what quality and outcomes we want to do. And then frankly, you know, I think not-for-profit providers should generally be able to do a better job because they don't have to actually think about their shareholders, for example. But if there's a private provider of home care, for example, who can come in under a government contract, for example, and actually provide that care, better outcomes, better quality, everything, and actually derive a profit and meet all those objectives, that's a harder task to achieve, but, you know, more power to them in that way. So I think there is a role. I think we're deluding ourselves if we don't think there's private elements in. What I don't think is we should start saying that, okay, well, maybe we should let, you know, maybe we should start having private hospitals and other things. I think having parallel systems is where we start getting problematic. But I actually think there is a role to play, but I think really it comes under the guise of the government setting what the rules are, being very careful about that, uh, and making sure that it always has control uh, in that way of the things that matter to us within our healthcare system. Hi, um, my name's Angela, and I'm a Master's of Public Health student here at Queen's, and I'm also a Western alumni, mm -hmm. so I'm glad to hear that you are also one of those. And fortunately, when I was doing my undergrad, I got a chance to take a few courses regarding aging and elder care, which kind of inspired me. But, um, and I'm glad that you mentioned the role of preventative medicine or health promotion and disease prevention, and I just wanted to hear your opinion on what the role of healthcare professionals that are interested in public health, um, specifically public health, like what you see the role is in um, elder care in the future. Yeah. So we, so the key is, you know, there's a, there's a huge element of preventative care when we think about our older patients as well. Most people think about vaccinations, they think about children and babies. They think about, you know, you have the schedule of vaccination for children. People forget that actually when you turn 65, older adults have a schedule of vaccinations as well. And every one of my consult notes, Dr. Mark knows, always ends off with prevention, you know, and, and wellness for that individual, right? So talking about bone health 
talking about, you know, how, are we making sure that they have all the right vaccinations they need to stay healthy and well, for example. Um, and there are many aspects. And everything from just participating in regular exercise, for example, staying socially connected. These are all issues that we can support. And also the other aspects of the social determinants of health, like making sure that someone's not in poverty. Because if they're in poverty, they're not going to be eating well. If they're not going to be eating well, then that can affect their overall health and well-being. So there's a huge opportunity for public health. But as we all know and recognize, public health is always the poor cousin of the healthcare system because you never see the direct benefits that instantaneously. I know I was very keen to see the minister invest $10 million through physiotherapy reform, um, $10 million to create 2,000 free exercise and falls prevention classes because I know that last year 106,000 older Ontarians fell and ended up in an emergency room. 26,000 of them ended up having hip fractures and hospitalized, hospitalized because of that. So now that we've had a full year of exercise classes, I thought, okay, I want to see the numbers fall immediately. And of course, you know, the numbers have stayed the same, which may mean that they're working, or maybe we need a little bit more time to see how that works. But sometimes you get people who are very impatient, and if they don't get the results immediately, they move on to something that's shiny, like a gamma knife or a helicopter, and they invest in that, because public health health is not sexy, um, but it's absolutely the essential thing. It's partly the reason why we're living almost double the years that we used to live as well. So I think there's a huge role for public health. It really still is the poor cousin. It's, you didn't even see a sliver on the budget there, really, but it's, it's there. It's just very tiny. But I think there's an opportunity to say we have to recognize more about that because there's a long-term benefit to public health, to getting us to 65, but then there's a role for public health in our, in our later years as well. Last word. Oh, that's, that's not fair. <laughs> I don't think my question is good enough. Um, so I have a question. Uh, sorry, my name is Keith Banting. I'm uh, a faculty member here in the School of Policy Studies. And I have a question uh, um, which is really about the pace of change that's possible. So you've outlined a very complex agenda which requires adjustments in a big complex, multifaceted set of institutions um, with often entrenched interests, and yet you are optimistic we're on our way. We're capable of getting there. And so one side of me wants to walk home reassured, I'm happy, we're going to get there, I'm on the leading edge of this personally, I'd like to be reassured that the system will be there for me. So that's one side of me, but then there's another side of me that said, says, wait a minute, I've been watching people struggle to restructure the healthcare system in Canada and in Ontario for decades. I watched Duncan Sinclair's commission, which sounded a lot like some of the things you're talking about. Absolutely. Moving hospitals into clinics. Uh, I watched the struggle to restructure primary care reform. Uh, and all of the resistance, the incredible, I can remember a minister said we're going to do it in three years, and then it turned out to be 10, 15, well, and we're still at it. And so what the, the other side of me says, the pace of change that's possible in this sector is glacial at best, and, with it, and, and, and this time clock won't change, it's coming at us quickly, and so there's a side of me that's going home very depressed. So why should I believe the optimistic scenario? Is it just you're an optimist as a personality? Or can you really see change that's accelerating so fast that I should go home happy? I think that's a fantastic last question. Um, <laughs> And it's often one that kind of keeps me up at night, too. I, I remember when I, was, when I had written this report, uh, I, when I finally wrote the report, I went home and I slept for about 10 days. Uh, and, uh, and then my brother sent me a copy of Yes, Minister right? Uh, those of you who know that well, because then I thought, my God, I've been living that for the last six months, and if I only just, if I only watched that earlier, I might have saved myself some trouble. Um, the point is that I think, you know, absolutely, you know, there are many people who've gone before me who had these recommendations. In fact, I'm part of the Home and Community Care Expert Working Group that's looking at the reform now of, of home and community care services in Ontario. And so you'll like this because, you know, our, our deliberations are confidential, but I can give you this example because I said, well, you know what's important? 
You know, the key is, I, I, someone sent me some recommendations that were made on an ALC working group back in 2009 that predates, you know, David's work and stuff. And I thought, yeah, and you know, the funny part was, I said, I've seen this recommendation 35 times in 35 reports. And yet it's such a good recommendation and no one's done it. And it's in my report too, because I really just co copied and pasted from everybody else's work at, you know, before me. That's what Mr. W told me to do. He's 104, he knows what to do. I mean, the key thing is, you know, it's absolutely, and so I said, you know, should we just say, you know, this recommendation was made by David Walker, Duncan Sinclair, everybody else, and you know, you still haven't done it. Can you finally do it? And someone said, no, 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 no. That's, you don't do that. Because if you do that, you know, then you're embarrassing people. You don't want to embarrass people. So what you want to do is you want to make it, you're hoping that if you keep saying it over and over again, this person will say, this is my idea, and this is how I'm going to move it forward. So it's, it's a bit of politics. It's a lot of politics. It's a little bit of timing. And I think the reasons why I'm optimistic is because I've had a lot of people ahead of me. Our healthcare system in its current permutations and combinations is now just over 50 years of age, which is great. I've had a lot of people ahead of me who've come up with these great ideas. And perhaps it's their timing wasn't right, if you will. Now that we have a huge aging demographic and the Globe and Mail and all our papers like to report and fearmonger about it every day, at least every politician is starting to think about it. People recognize that the older demographic votes. We have our major national associations pressuring around it. So, you know, part of it's about timing. But, you know, and I think part of it's about, it's always about opportunity as well. And so I think if enough of us are starting to say, we need to be on top of this, we need to get this together, I'm actually hoping that we're going to get traction. And it was interesting, I have, to give, I have to give applause to the previous Minister of Health in particular, because she said, the usual structure to do this is we hire someone to write a report and then they go away and, and then they just watch everyone else, you know, kind of dance around it. She says, I actually believe in this because she actually has a PhD in social demography, um, you know, Minister Matthews. Uh, and she said, you know what, if I keep you in government, if I keep you after the report, I'm going to help you keep us honest and help us push things ahead. And the fact that we were able to push through a number of policy items, legislative, things that are sexy, things that are not sexy forward, you know, gives me hope that there's still an opportunity to keep pushing that agenda forward. But it's about being relentless. It's about being focused. It's funny that I'm now going to be part of the Donner Report on home and community care. And I thought, but didn't I just write a report and work on a report with David? But hey, that's the game. But it's a game I'm willing to pay because, you know what, in 30 years, I'm going to be in my golden years, and it's got to be right by then. So I'm going to be relentless, and I think we all need that too. Thank you. If Keith's, if Keith's was uh, the last great question, that truly was the last great answer. Um, on behalf of the School of Medicine, School of Policy Studies, Queen's University, and all of us here, and all of those who are watching on podcasts, uh, please join with me in thanking Samir Sinha so much for an, uh, an engaged and thought-provoking presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and before, and before we, we go, um, Samir never got to do what is called the, uh, the Grant Hall experience. Um, uh, he graduated from uh, Queen's. Um, but was already at uh, medical school by the time graduation rolled around and uh, uh, U of T Medical School, Western, Western sorry, Western Medical School, um, uh, did the nasty of, of scheduling an exam uh, so that he actually could not walk across the stage. We, we can't reproduce that tonight, but we can give you a little bit of uh, uh, Queen's uh, memorabilia um, for that particular loss. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you very much. There are, there are still uh, uh, refreshments on the side. Thank you very much indeed for coming tonight, and uh, we will see you hopefully the next time. Thank you.